4, Swissborg. 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 Swissborg est sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the markets. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Bobby Ong, co-founder of CoinGecko, one of the most reliable crypto data websites in the space. And talking about awesome websites, a big shout out to Crypto Slate, Nate, and the team for always creating awesome summaries of all these interviews for those who want to read the summarized version. But you also want to watch this interview until the very end because we're going to talk about crypto data, accuracy, effectiveness, what really matters, what brought Bobby Ong on board in the crypto space and lots of cool content. So without further ado, Bobby, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing really, really well, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I really loved your article on Coin, uh, about CoinGecko on Crypto Slate. And the very first question I'd love to ask you, Bobby, is going back, rewinding back to 2012 when you graduated uh, from your college in London and then you suddenly started getting involved in Bitcoin, the, the Satoshi white paper. Can you tell us a little bit about your story and why you really fell in love with this space? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So uh, this was uh, in 2012, 2013. I, I graduated back then with a degree in economics from UCL in London. And uh, I was trying to teach myself how to code, how to program. And I spent a lot of time in, in tech forums. And one of the forums that I hang out and I spent a lot of time was uh, Hacker News. And uh, back then in 2013, um, Everyone was sort of talking about this new form of money, Bitcoin. And I thought I was curious because I spent like three years in London learning supposedly everything about money, but my lecturers did not mention Bitcoin at all. So I thought this was kind of odd. Why did my lecturers not teach me about Bitcoin, which is another form of money? Um, either these tech guys in, on Hacker News on, in Silicon Valley, they're crazy or my lecturers are obsolete. So there's, there's two ways about it. I thought like, I'm young, there's no harm. Let me read the Bitcoin white paper. Let's see what's going to happen. I read it. And this was on the backdrop of quantitative easing uh, after the financial crisis, 2009 financial crisis. I thought it was not sustainable, governments printing a lot of money. And look where we are now in 2020, 2021, 2020, 2021, where governments are doing trillion dollar money printing exercise again. Uh, so I thought like this can't go on forever. Let me read it. I thought it was interesting. I thought the idea of self-sovereign money was very interesting. The fact that you control your own money and no one in the world can take it away from you. Um, you have cases where money in the bank account, like money in PayPal being frozen all the time. So I thought that was not cool. I bought my first Bitcoin using local Bitcoins. Um, Coinbase wasn't available where I was. Um, and I just basically, it was quite a crappy experience buying Bitcoin back then. You, you basically kind of like find people who are willing to sell you Bitcoin and then you agree on a price and you're like, okay, send money to this random person's bank account and hopefully he delivers a Bitcoin to you. So I thought I sent the money over. Surprise, surprise! The Bitcoin came by like one day later, and I like, and I moved it to my wallet, which I control. And I thought like, okay, this is game changer, right? So now for the first time in my life, I have money, pretty much like cash in my wallet. And the more I look into it, the more I study, I realize there are many different altcoins as well. Uh, Namecoin was one of them. You could kind of have decentralized domain name system, and then there was early versions of uh, the BitShares white paper, which was kind of like talks up a lot about smart contracts. BitShares didn't take off, but Everything in that white paper, you can kind of see it in Ethereum these days with the smart contracts and DeFi and everything today. Uh, I thought that this was really interesting, game changer, and it will kind of revolutionize finance uh, in the future. And I think five years, six years from now, uh, we kind of see what is happening in the place, in the space, and more will come by in the next few years. Amazing, amazing. Well, people thought you were crazy back then, but now they probably think you're a genius right now. So uh, that probably changed a lot, you know, in, in the evolution since. Uh, 2012, 2013. And I'd love to ask you, like, Bobby, like, you know, when we look back at 2020, and obviously DeFi was one of the big topics, you know, with AUM going up to $20.4 billion, literally, like, 
multiple X every single month in terms of people getting involved in staking their assets. Is that the number one highlight of 2020? Or what do you think when you look back, what do you really feel was our highlight of 2020? Yeah, I would say DeFi was kind of the, the, the game changer for 2020, right? So when it started the year, like I have no idea that DeFi is going to be the thing, right? We, we, we were involved in DeFi. We were playing all these uh, DeFi applications. And at the start of the year, we thought like DeFi is really cool, but not many people know about it. So we at CoinGecko kind of decided that let's kind of take it onto ourselves to educate people as much as we can about DeFi. So we wrote this book called How to DeFi, which was the world's first book on, on DeFi and no one had written it before. Uh, we just kind of explain like how to use Uniswap, how to use uh, uh, Pool Together uh, and all these other DeFi, DeFi applications, SNX and so on. So synthetics. Um, and then sometime in the summer, like Compound launched with this uh, liquidity mining program and then things started going crazy. We did not foresee that happening at all. Uh, and, and, and DeFi, DeFi definitely took off last year. I think in terms of decentralized exchanges, that was a big game changer, right? Like everyone was trading on centralized exchanges like Binance, Huobi, Coinbase, so on, right? Uh, nobody was trading on DEX because it was kind of pretty hard to use. Uh, I mean, the DEXs before Uniswap was kind of like Fog Delta and all. Kind of pretty crappy experience if you ask me. But the AMM and like the, the liquidity and the swap feature makes it so simple and Anyone could participate. There was no KYC requirement. So I think that was a big thing and, and everybody kind of moved to Uniswap and, and liquidity mining, yield farming, you know, was kind of like the, the petrol on the fire that kind of made whole, whole, whole industry explode last year. So yes, DeFi was definitely the defining feature. If you look at DAX, DAX volume grew so much last year. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it was close to 18,000% growth in trading volumes for DEXs. And yeah, it was a great year last year for, De for DeFi. It was amazing. And I think Uniswap did a really good job at capturing a lot of that trading volume on top of that. And uh, yeah, I will definitely want to ask you about your predictions for 2021, guys. So don't forget to stay tuned until the very end. But before asking you that question, so obviously we talked about DeFi here. And I know that CoinGecko did something really, really cool, which is include DeFi in your website, get more people to you know list tokens, give the information that people want to know. Could you tell us a little bit about CoinGecko and, and what makes CoinGecko so special? And then after that, I love to ask you questions, Bobby, about finding accurate data and not just any type of data, because that's another uh, challenge that we have in itself. Yeah, so we saw the trend in DeFi and we took it upon ourselves to kind of like do our best to track everything that's happening in, in the DeFi space well. So uh, we were one of the first data aggregators to accurately track uh, Uniswap uh, V1 and then following on Uniswap V2 and then we integrated, we were quite quick in integrating uh, Balancer, Curve and all the other DeFi uh, exchanges. I think because of our, I mean, back then it was, it was not a, it was not a very uh, easy technical task because a lot of exchanges we were using uh, REST API or WebSocket API from centralized exchanges. You could kind of get the data quite easily. But when it comes to DEXs, we ask them, hey, can we get your data? They just tell us, go get it from the chain. Like, okay, I mean, it sounds very easy to say, but you could do it, but there's a lot of work because the website was written in such a way that it supports centralized exchanges. So we had to do a lot of re-architecture to kind of do it. Thankfully, uh, the graph sort of launched and uh, a lot of projects were preparing subgraph and that was one of the ways where we could kind of use data from the graph to put onto CoinGecko and we had to figure out a way how to use the subgraphs and, and, and manage to do it first. So yeah, we, we did that. We also did the, um, the, the, the yield farming page on CoinGecko. So you could kind of see where were all the hottest yield farms and, and I, it was really interesting, right? Everyone was looking into it. Everyone was looking for the, 1,000%, 5,000%, 10,000% APY. <laughs> good times, good times with, with all these farms. Uh, getting less these days, but every once in a while, a few very attractive farms come up again. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to put you on the spot just a little bit, but what are some of the data sets that really blew your mind, Bobby, in 2020 or even recently? Were there any, any data sets, like misconceptions that we may have as people, but when you saw the data, you're like, Boom. Are there any examples of that that you have for us? Yeah, I think I think we were surprised, right? Uh, with regards to the trading volume for Uniswap. Uh, then you look into like SushiSwap and, and things like I think last year um uh Uniswap grew. Like Uniswap like had so much trading volume, uh it just grew and everybody was using it. Like at one point it was doing 
as much trading volume as Coinbase on a 24 hours basis. So that was kind of like mind breaking, right? If you ask me at the start of 2020 and you say, I will bet you like X amount of BTC or whatever amount that Uniswap is going to have one day where you do more trading volume than Coinbase. I say, get out of the room. I won't, I won't take that back. <laughs> but I would say the same. But, but the fact that Uniswap achieved that even for one day was quite a, a very, very big, amazing thing, right? So, so yeah, I couldn't have foreseen that happening uh, last year. Uh, it took place, which is a very good thing for DeFi because uh, it's good for, for the economy, for, for everyone to kind of use decentralized exchanges. I want to ask you kind of the flip side of what is a bit scarier, what could be the kryptonite of Superman uh, this year. A lot of people say that regulatory issues are, are a bit scary in terms of the DEXs and how will they be regulated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, USDT as well, like with what happened with Ripple recently, uh, the SEC cracking down on potential coins and tokens, USDT, if there's a black swan event. But what is scary for you? And obviously, we don't want to be negative here. I don't want to be a negative Nancy, but are there any potential risks and, and more negative news that we need to be careful or, or follow uh, diligently this year? I, I was a tether skeptic for many years. I didn't really... I just wasn't very sure if they have uh, the bank balances in their bank for many years. Uh, there was this controversy for since 2014 or so, or 2015, since they launched basically, because they have bank account issues and they have like a billion dollars frozen across the world and they had to launch the Leo token because I think last year or was it last year or the year before where they, they, they find out that they don't actually have the dollars in their bank account. And that's why they had to launch the Leo token to kind of cover up the, the missing gap. Um, I think Tether is indeed uh, a, a big risk factor. But I think Tether, um, I mean, it survived so many years so far. Like it seems, I mean, the big Bitfinex uh, guys, Paolo, Paolo will say that it's regulated in US with all the FinCEN regulations and also uh, maybe, maybe it is, I hope it is. Uh, I hope I hope Tether won't, won't go down because if it does, then it is uh, a single biggest uh, risk biggest that it will take down the entire market as well. But I think if you look at the stable coin section by itself, like it is a lot more, it's a lot better this time around compared to what it was previously. If you look at what it was two, three years ago, Tether was the only stable coin around. These days, we have alternatives. We have USDC, we have DAI, you know, that's TUSD, GUSD, so many other stable coins. If Tether goes down, yes, it's going to be to have an impact, but it wouldn't have as large a systemic risk as what it was two, three years ago. So we have alternatives today. Uh, in terms of regulation, yes, maybe the stable act in the US might come in place and that might impact things. Um, we should see how. We don't know yet. Uh, Joe Biden just got sworn in um, uh, as president of the US, so things may change. Um, but I think, I think in terms of DeFi regulations, I don't think it will come so soon. Uh, the SEC took five years before they made any action on XRP, on Ripple. So if any regulations come by for DeFi, it will probably come by in a few years' time. Uh, regulations generally are lagging. The regulators need to understand things and before they can take any action. So I don't think it will be a big factor for DeFi this year, but maybe in the future, I'm not so sure yet. It's still kind of very murky and undefined at this point in time. I think a lot of people would agree that this could be the black swan event if USDT does crash. It could have a massive impact on the market, but you're confident that with USDC and other coins and tokens, stable coins that are regulated, audited, you believe that we would have a rescue plan, right? It is a risk, but I don't think it's going to happen. But I don't know. Who, who knows, right? It's hard to say. I, I wouldn't say it on record. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet my life that that is not going to fail. I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it does, like we have backups these days. Crossing fingers on that for sure. <laughs> and one thing, Bobby, that I really like about CoinGecko is you guys uh, have data sets and statistics that are slightly different from other, you know, uh, websites that offer, you know, news about tokens, about exchanges, about transaction volume, trading volume. Um, and I would love to ask you, you know, when it comes to trading volume, like, how can we find accurate data? I know it's it's a very difficult question and it's probably something that we can never 100% solve. But, um, you know, obviously with all the trading volume we see with different coins and tokens, a lot of it is leveraged. A lot of it is just purely wash traded. Um, but uh, can you give us a few tips, you know, for the people out there who really want to find the most accurate data possible about, about coins and tokens? That would be great. What I would say is wash trading is a massive problem in crypto. Um, I like to use this line where I would say that anything that gets measured gets manipulated. Uh, so trading volume is obviously measured quite a lot uh, in, in crypto space and this get manipulated quite badly. 
uh, by many many exchange teams. Uh, market caps another one that is mass, uh, that is that is uh, measured quite rapidly. So some coins they manipulate they try to manipulate their market cap and make their, their market cap look really high as well. Uh, yeah, let's talk about trading volume. Uh, watch trading is a big issue. Um, essentially, we've reached a point where we at CoinGecko think that any exchange that is not licensed, not regulated by any financial regulator, it's, we can't really trust their trading volume because they can just report whatever they think they want to report. And if they fake it, there's really no repercussions. Actually, there's no regulator that can say, hey, you're putting out watch trading, you have fake data and all that. No one can reprimand them. And a lot of these came from Chinese exchanges or maybe the Chinese, like you said, Asian exchanges. Uh, so a lot of this trading volume from Chinese exchanges can't really, uh, it's questionable, I would say. Um, so what I would do if, if you are interested in getting real trading volume data, like um, I would probably only look at exchanges that are regulated, that have a license. So most likely this would mean the US, US exchanges, like maybe Coinbase, Gemini, those exchanges, because they have licenses, they, they can't, Fake, they can't, they can't, they can't fake their data, right? Yeah. Um, and, and if you want to know, so we at CoinGecko, we kind of take the approach where, uh, we have to sort of kind of track exchanges on the, some are regulated, some are not. How do we kind of put a framework to rank these exchanges, right? So we kind of say volume is one, but it cannot be the only factor. So we kind of look into many different factors. Uh, some exchanges, they, they may claim that they have a billion dollars in daily trading volume, but then, their web traffic, there's like barely anyone visiting the website, right? So most likely it is fake, uh, but maybe some 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 of them could be true, right? Like exchanges like Eatbit, where they have they do a lot of enterprise uh, backend API uh, API integration with PayPal, for example. So they they don't get a lot of uh, retail users, but they get a lot of um, uh, volume on their site. So, but generally speaking, crypto is still quite a retail focus. Uh, game. Uh, if you claim you have a large trading volume, uh, most likely you should have a lot of visitors to your website. So using tools like SimilarWeb, Alexa, you could kind of get an idea if the exchange is sort of faking or not faking their trading volume, and then you can kind of compare it again. So you can kind of do a a, a ratio between the volume and the and the and the traffic. Uh, the, the other metric that we look at as well is order book data, order book stats. So an exchange that claims they have a lot of trading volume will most likely should have a very thick order book as well. Uh, but exchange that some exchanges, they don't have a thick order book. The bid and ask spread could be large and then they just make a lot of trades in between the bid and ask. So if you start seeing all this kind of thing, then, you know, it's highly likely that there's some hanky panky going on as well in the exchange. So yeah, these are probably some of the, the tips I would say on on trying to find out whether the exchange has real or not so real data, I would say. Actually, some people who I work with, that's what they usually do to really check transaction or tr sorry, trading volume. They go directly to Coinbase since they're regulated and, and they kind of use that as the benchmark, right? But I think that's really good advice to, to look at the exchanges that are regulated to really check the website, check the order book itself, see how deep the order book is. Some really, really good tips. And I have uh, something to ask you, Bobby, related to that. What if you see a coin or token that has triple the amount of trading volume than its own market cap? Is that a red flag to you? I, I, don't, I think that's not really a problem because, I mean, you could have coins where they only have like $1 million in market cap and then they have like $3 million in trading volume. Uh, I think you see this quite a lot for small cap coins, uh, Uniswap coins, uh, especially when they have uh, yield farming, liquidity mining, or some like when they launch in the early days, like I, I think it's possible. It's um, not, uh, it's okay. I mean, but if you look at the large cap coins, uh, like I don't know, one billion dollar, and then we have like three billion in trading volume, then I, I maybe maybe it's hard. But 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 yeah, sometimes we look at this ratio to kind of get an idea if we, but but it's hard to say, right? Sometimes, yeah. That's a really good point. You know, if it's a micro cap versus a large cap, you know, the data could be completely different depending on the activity. And, and that's a really good point. I like it. Because some of the people where we talk to and, and the people in our investment team, they say if if it's a large cap token and has three times the trading volume than the market cap, it's very likely to be BS. <laughs> but of course, guys, do your own uh, due diligence out there and look at the data yourselves. Try to uh, investigate these things deeply. It's very important to understand the truth 
Um, other than that, so I'd love to ask you about your predictions for 2021, Bobby. Like, what are some of the events that you're the most excited about? If you could tell us, maybe go from a general standpoint on Bitcoin, your stance on Ethereum, and then just the general crypto assets market would be great on, on what you're seeing happening now at the moment and what may play out in 2020, 2021. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think 2021 is going to be the year um, in the year of institutions, right? This will be the year, like, we'll be talking about this from 2013, like, institutions are coming to crypto at some point. Institutions will start buying Bitcoin at some point. 2021 is the year, right? Like, when you have micro strategy buying 70,000 Bitcoin worth $1 billion, that is big news. Everyone's talking about you on Wall Street. Like, everyone who's running a public company, they will want to have some sort of uh, Bitcoin in their treasury. Because why not, right? It is a headline grabbing event and people will start to look at your stock and uh, some of the more active, the more entrepreneurial guys will start to look into it. I won't be surprised if Tesla starts buying uh, Bitcoin and hold it on the treasury. I'm sure a lot of them are buying it. They just haven't announced it yet because why announce if you're still buying it? You want to complete your asset purchase, have the required number of Bitcoin or treasury before you make an announcement. So I think a lot of companies are doing that right now. You just, especially... Look out for, for, for buy orders on weekdays as well, US times as well. So we don't know who, but I think it's just a matter of time before they announce that they've acquired X number of Bitcoin for X amount of dollars. So yeah, that, this will be the year, uh, where institutions come in. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to, I'm, I'm personally looking at Bitcoin price chart on a logarithmic scale, not on a linear scale. So, so it has like zero, 100, 1000, 10,000 and 100,000 dollars lines, right? So, if you look at the Bitcoin's chart from its inception in 20, 2009, I think they have data from like 20, 2011 or so onwards, right? And if you look at its chart from on a log scale, you can kind of see that it tracks pretty closely. You can kind of draw like two upward sloping lines on a support and resistance level. And this year seems to be, seems to indicate that it might touch 100k and uh, not just me, right? A few other banks. I think Morgan Stanley or so, or JP Morgan said that you will hit 164k. Who knows, right? Uh, competitor to go. But uh, I don't know. But I think institutions going to come in. Um, at some point, governments will start holding Bitcoin. Uh, my bet would be a small central bank, uh, a, country, a country of a central bank of a small country might start holding Bitcoin. But it could also be the case that some state or local authorities might start holding Bitcoin. I think the mayor of Miami has said that he would hold Bitcoin if he could. So I think they are probably thinking of how to hold actually to hold custody and all this regulatory stuff. So let's see. I think Bitcoin is going to be like institutions um, coming in. Uh, but all the institutions are all probably going to pile into Bitcoin first. They probably won't go into Ethereum and, and all so on. So uh, my, my, my prediction as well would be that Ethereum is going to hit its all-time high, uh, break past 1,005. I think we've hit its all-time high. Uh, I don't think we broke past 1,005 yet, but... Um, at some point, I think this year will be the year where Ethereum must scale. So a lot of, uh, a lot of time will be spent in the community trying to coordinate a layer two scalability solution. So everyone's going to, everyone's going to find, we all have to find a solution, whether it's, it could be optimism, it could be ZK rollup. We don't know which one, but this is the year where we probably have to find a way for all these guys to go onto a layer two solution. Uh, in terms of other, uh, in terms of DeFi, right? I think DeFi is gonna going to continue growing this year. Uh, I think if you look at the long scale of things, DeFi is just at its beginning. We will have like 10x, 100x growth in the next five years. Uh, you know, saying it sounds very easy to say five years, right? But try holding a token for five years. That's actually a very hard thing, right? Uh, uh, we don't know. I hope most of them will stay on, but who knows, right? Uh, I think a lot of uh, lay one, there's a couple of layer one, app, uh, platforms, Serum and Polkadot, uh, launching, uh, not launching. Polkadot's gonna launch this year with parachains and also, I think very interesting to, to, to see how Polkadot function and, and take off. I think this is gonna be the year of Polkadot as well. Uh, obviously everyone wants to have a piece of DeFi. So we will see a lot of DeFi applications launching on Polkadot. I think, one metric that I would want to look at would be to see how many actual users would there be on Polkadot and later on on Serum as well. Because a lot of these layer one platforms, they, they, they come on with like big promises like low transaction fee, high throughput and all. But can you actually get the users? Ethereum is the only platform besides Bitcoin that has real active users. Uh, you have 
chains like EOS, Tron, and so on, and all these other day one, but like they can't seem to big promises, but they can't seem to get like mass number of users coming to use their platform. So I think this year we have to see if Polkadot can do it. Maybe they will be like uh, I think Compound, Aave, and you know, all might want to launch on some of these platforms. We don't, I don't know if they will do it or not, but I think that I think they're all actively thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, yeah, these are these are some of the high level. I have a few more if you want me to go through. Or, or yeah, that's, that's yeah. Good. Please do, please do. Actually, you're transitioning exactly the questions I wanted to ask you, so I can just let you go. <laughs> all right. So so yeah, I actually made an eight prediction. So I've kind of gone through half, and I I, I walked through the, the rest of it at the start of the year. So. Um, I think I think this year is probably going to be the year uh, for DeFi derivatives as well. So if you look at DeFi, we have some clear winners, right? So in terms of lending and borrowing protocols, like two two clear sector leaders, Aave, Compound, these are the two guys, right? They they clearly had dominant position in this space, and and I don't know if we can find anyone trying to compete. So we have like clear winners in this space. DeFi, Dexes. Uh, for spot trading, I think we have clear winners in Uniswap. We have SushiSwap. Uh, and then we have the aggregators, but they can't compete. Unis Uniswap's a clear winner by far, right? In terms of DeFi derivatives, so I think this is very interesting. This is the year where everyone's going to be competing to build and find a winner for the futures platform on, on for, for DeFi, future DEX uh, derivatives platform for DeFi. So there are a few players at this point in time, perp.fit. P, uh, DYDX, and a few other guys, but there's no clear leader in the space right now. So I think this will be a very hotly contested area. Uh, futures, perpetual options. There's so many options platform now, OP and Hedgig and so on, but there's no clear winner. So I think this will be the year where a lot of these guys will be competing to be the winner. Um, I think prediction market is going to be interesting as well. We've talked about it for so many years from the launch of Augur in 2015 or so, 2015, 2016, I think. Uh, but I think we saw the U.S. prediction, uh, U.S. presidential election, that there's a lot of uh, interest in 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 prediction markets. I think we start seeing uh, some of these user friendly platforms launching, but no main use case. I mean, no major traction yet. So I'm I'm hopeful that there will be a push towards prediction market this year as well. So we start seeing some teams launching um, futures, right? Like like Coinbase price like what would be the price of the market cap of coinbase when it actually ipos on new c for example so some sort of prediction markets like that uh, might take place um, stable coins i think uh, it's very interesting a lot of uh, teams are trying to build like decentralized stable coins because uh, we, they all talk about tether being kind of a systemic risk to this ecosystem uh, algorithmic stable coins are very interesting. Uh, there's a few different flavors, uh, ESD, DSD, basis cash. Uh, my personal favorite is uh, Frax. I thought it was interesting that they have fractional reserve and they balance it with the, the, the share FSX token. We should see, right? I think, I think DAI had a lead because they are kind of the first decentralized stable coin, but can DAI maintain its lead when all these other guys come in? I think it would be interesting to see if they can kind of challenge. Many would die off. It would be kind of a yield farming thing, but but maybe one or two might stay on and challenge. Um, NFT would be interesting um, to watch. Uh, but I think NFT is still in its early days. I don't think this year will be the year for NFT. I think maybe in a year or two, but a lot of projects, a lot of things will, will, will work and build on NFT. And this is kind of a good time, right? Like the early projects are like, it's like DeFi, right? You don't want to buy. I mean, I guess you can still say DeFi is still early, but it would be even better if you had learned about DeFi like one year ago in, in January 2019, for example, or like not Jan January 2020 or like mid 2019, where you participate in synthetics, in, in Aave, in Maker, because when it comes, like it's just going to be explosion and, and it's just so hard trying to catch up and learn on everything because everything is sort of built on top of everything else. So. So yeah, I think NFT is gonna have that that moment maybe in one or two years time, and when that happens, like things are gonna go bonkers. So it's always good to kind of know what's happening in the space right now, but it's still kind of manageable. Yeah, that's kind of my take of of on things. Yeah, that's an amazing take, Bobby. Yeah, you really looked at everything. You covered Bitcoin, the potential price surge all the way up to 100k. You talked about Ethereum and its challengers. Personally, I do think that proof of stake layer one chains is going to be the most important topic when it comes to the technological advancements. And will they be able to challenge Ethereum is the question that everyone is wondering, right? Will they get the adoption? 
Will they be able to get uh, platforms to build on top of them? Uh, just a follow-up question on Ethereum. Obviously, Ethereum has the most adoption. We know that Polkadot got funding by Binance, got funding by Hobie to build DeFi platforms on DOT. They have a great treasury um, and they have parachains, which is uh, a lot more interesting. A lot of, For a lot of people out there watching and thinking, what's the difference between Ethereum and Polkadot is Polkadot with parachains. You, it's like having your own private office to create your own democratic rules, your own personalized governance, and just use Polkadot as your validator. While Ethereum, it's more like a, a room sharing, like a co-working space which is very different. And obviously people do not do not necessarily agree with the governance on Ethereum. And if they really want to build their own fully owned governance, they would go through a parachain. But um, I would love to ask you, like, do you see Ethereum losing market share in terms of uh, all the AUM captured through DeFi because Polkadot, because let's say Elrond, because Cardano, all these third gen blockchains are coming in with a new offering? Or do you still see Ethereum really owning more than 90% like it does today? Yeah, I think there will be competition uh, because Ethereum at its current state, like without sharding and all, like it, there's only so much that you can handle. Like it's really full, right? Nobody's going to pay like $20, $30 per block on Ethereum. Like, I mean, to make a single transaction, like that's not really, I mean, people have been using it, but everyone wants a solution, an alternative to it. So I think if Polkadot launched and managed to get captured the attention of a lot of people, some will move, but I think Ethereum still has a lot of developer mindshare. Um, it won't be like instant, right? It won't be like tomorrow everyone's going to move to Polkadot. It will be a gradual process. People will have to see whether it makes sense and then they have to learn and use and interact with it. So um, I would say that, that it may lose some market share, but in terms of all the layer one platform, it will still have maybe at least 80% or I would say 90% of everything. I would say 80, 90% at the end of the year. Yeah. Fantastic, Bobby. This has been an amazing, amazing interview to learn about all the data side of things, your predictions, what were the highlights of 2020? So much useful information. So I see you're active on Twitter, Bobby. Like any anywhere where you want us to follow you. Obviously, guys, don't forget to check out CoinGecko. It's an amazing website with many may say more accurate data than other websites that uh, that talk about coins and tokens and exchanges. But anything that you'd like to share with the community? Yeah, follow CoinGecko on all our social channels like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and so on. And and uh, if you want to con contact me directly, you can find me at Bobby Yong on Twitter and just drop me a DM and I usually respond to most messages. Thank you so much, Bobby. You guys heard it. Don't forget to follow Bobby Young on Twitter and CoinGecko, an amazing site for data and statistics related to the crypto sphere. And don't forget to join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. We love you. Blast the bell notification, like, comment, and support us as much as you can. Thank you so much, guys, and see you next Wednesday.